Welcome to Routing for Success, the show where we interview today's top logistics professionals, providing them a platform to share their stories and best practices. I'm your host, Emily Blair, joined by Jake Hirsch. Today's guest is Norb Kohler. Norb has been a BC with Absolute Ground Delivery for about two and a half years, running FedEx Line Hall. He is a broker and consultant for the Western regions of Ground Consult, and he's joining us today to share the pros and cons of spot runs. Enjoy the episode. This episode is brought to you by AP Equipment Financing. AP Equipment Financing can bring you the best deals on step vans, panel vans, cutaways, and more. Deliver them straight to your facility and finance them with low monthly installment options. Click the link in the description to this episode or visit APFinancing.com. With us today is Norb Kohler. Norb is the resident expert in spot runs. And Norb, on this podcast, we have a lot of people that are listening that um, have been in FedEx for a long time. A lot of people that are listening that are thinking about buying into FedEx and a lot of people listening that are maybe a year or two in. Can you explain to us what is a spot run in FedEx? Yeah, great. Thanks for having me, uh, Jake and Emily. Happy to be on with you guys today. Um, So first of all, I chuckle a little bit when you say the resident expert. I don't know if I'm the resident expert. Let's just say I'm I'm extremely passionate about it. And um, maybe a little bit of context. Um, I was brought on uh, with a gentleman whose name is Joel Thompson. He runs Absolute Ground Delivery out of Arcadia, California. And um, I operate as a BC for him and a CFO and do financials and help purchase trucks and things like that. And so in the beginning, we were kind of reviewing this. We're like, first thing we're going to do is ditch the spot runs uh, when he purchased this company. And it's like, we're going to get rid of those things. They're probably in the way. Can't really see how they function properly. And then about a couple months in, we're like, I think we'll keep these guys and probably try to add to these guys because they're very, very productive. So just on a very high level, and many of the people watching might be very familiar with this. So just as a brief overview you know, the typical, when you think of FedEx line hall, you think of over the road, you think of truck going to Miami, Denver, Albuquerque, and back home, right? So you got that at a 30,000 foot level. And then you, you, go, you go come down to sort of like AM and PM runs that are solo runs that go terminal to terminal destination or, or, you know, meet other runs and swap trailers. And then you come down to the infamous spot runs. So spot runs are essentially servicing FedEx contractors in a local um, terminal area. So most spot runs, let's say in our area, would run no more than in a 60, maybe even a 40 mile radius. Um, We did an average one time, I think average, our spot guys put on 190 miles uh, um, a day. Uh, Although that can be betrayed. I mean, we've had spot runs that run 300 miles a day, but typically they're shorter runs and they can go um, do trailer swaps for companies. We got furniture stores, Costco's, Walmart's, Targets, that kind of thing. And so, on average, spot guys can do anywhere from 13 to 16 hook and drops a day, where they're transferring trailers, uh, bringing empties, picking up full trailers, and bringing them back to FedEx. So that's that's the general overview. So rather than sitting in a cab for a day or over the road for a week. These guys are in and out of the cab all day, you know, hooking up trailers, dropping trailers. And so, yeah, it's pretty active. So that that's sort of a general overview. Thank you. And with the spot runs, you're paid a little bit differently than a lot of those over the road that'll, that most people think of, right? So over the road, you expect cents per mile. Uh, can you explain how you're right. paid on a spot run? Yeah. So spot runs, even though it will show up as a... As a um, uh, you, it can be viewed as per mile, but it's not. It's per trailer drop, right? So you're, you're getting paid for hook and drops, and you're also getting paid per delivery to that specific um, company. So, and, and it can vary pretty drastically. Like we have variances between a guy that takes a, a trailer, you know, 15 miles, and it can be a different price than another company drop. So it, it varies for sure. And Norb, so 
Before you mentioned when you came in, you were anticipating completely getting rid of your spot runs. And that changed in the next couple months. What was it that coming in, why did you want to get rid of your spot runs? And then what made you change your mind? Well, I think I was probably jaded a little bit, to be honest. It was about five years ago that I was sort of researching the whole FedEx thing. And then I got into, uh, let's call it uh, consulting for FedEx buyers. And and as I was doing the research, I, I was discovering that not only was I looking at sort of the utopic, hey, I want dedicated runs, right? Like, so people are thinking, am I going to get into the space? I want dedicated runs because everything else is sort of worth less. Not worthless, but worth less than just the simple dedicated runs. They're easy to run, they're predictable, so on and so forth. So I think that was the initial sort of like, hey, you've got these dedicated day runs. We didn't have any over the road. And we were at that time probably doing a million and a half in revenue. Good, solid, um, dedicated runs. And it's predictable. What changed my mind was how fluid spots were and not every contractor and i've discovered this because we've talked to we now run out of industry arcadia and rialto which which are rialto's arguably the, the biggest hub in in america maybe number two and so there's a you bump into a lot of contractors and not all contractors treat spots the same i can tell you that and having had robust conversations on how they do that um, you can have spot trucks bring in um, you know twenty eight hundred dollars a week three thousand dollars a week um, <clears throat> last week one of our spot trucks brought in over nine thousand dollars wow now i know that's gonna blow away some people that are listening to the podcast that's in one <laughs> week maybe <clears throat> yeah maybe even in the chat go that guy's a liar he's no expert he's just a fraud <laughs> you know a spot truck can't bring in nine thousand dollars a week you know um, so, but beyond what the potential for the spot is and how you run them, which is another topic, I think the most important thing we realize is the fluidity between the delivery method and the driver. For example, you know, say a guy calls in sick. So we run seven spot trucks, well, seven and a half. My manager still does part-time driving and he, he, um, you know, takes care of some of the spots as well. So if a guy wants a day off, take his kids to Disneyland, let's say, because that's in our neighborhood, absolutely no problem. We, we make that absolutely clear. If a guy wants a day off, no problem, because now the six guys take care of the seven functioning spot trucks, right? So they just do a little bit more, and they're happy to do that because they make more money, right, if they're delivering more. So if we, we've had a PM run, in fact, this happened last April, we got... We had like four guys go on vacation in April. It was insane. But the reason why we can let all those guys go at the same time is because we now we do roughly about $3 million a year in revenue, but there's a lot more fluidity in allowing spot drivers to cover PM runs. So the guy will take the week and say, yeah, I'll do that PM run or that day run while the guy goes on vacation. So that was probably the biggest aha moment is, wait a second, I've got seven guys that drive here that, that work hard. Spot drivers work extremely hard, right? Um, we charge them extra because it's an exercise program. They got to get in and out of the truck all the time. So it's, it's, it's really good, right? So um, Joel, uh, the AO of Absolute Ground, he, he runs arguably the best um, CrossFit gym in Orange County, California. <laughs> like he, he, you know, they're all buff and fit. So it, it naturally just goes into how are we going to help our drivers, right? Spot truck drivers, it's a great exercise program, but they work extremely hard and the ability just to navigate, hey, you, you can do this, you can do this, even the change in mileage. So um, it's just extremely fluid. Now, one of the caveats to that or things that I have to mention with that is you got to have a manager that understands how this works, right? So our manager, Sal, um, the guy's the freak of nature, right? He's just amazing. And um, he's 30 and he's been in FedEx for 10 years. So he, he, a lot of history, right? Young driver, a lot of history. And this guy just knows how to manipulate, you know, what runs go where and how this works and shift the guys around. 
And so it, it, becomes, it becomes a very fluid thing and you maximize. Now, one more thing about how contractors handle it. Like I've heard contractors that they literally take the calls and, and call their drivers as to where they're going next. Like, so if you imagine you have seven, seven, you know, spot trucks that go in, they each do 16 a day. Like that's a lot of calls at who, who's going where. We don't do that. Sal has a, a prescribed spot run for each of these guys that is sort of the normal. It's like the foundation that you build on. So they already know they're delivering, you know, to these 16 trailer drops that day. And then he'll be able to shift them around quickly to maximize you know, and optimize those routes so that make sure everybody's doing the maximum. Does that make that sense? That does make sense. Can you talk just a little bit more about how Sal manages as far as when he's organizing these spot runs? Is it all within your control as a contractor or is he working with dispatch and the terminal and other contractors? Can you talk about a, that communication a little bit? Yeah. So, um, gosh. You guys are twisting my arm to give away Sal <laughs> secrets. He's, he's gonna he's gonna kill me. No, really. We he he he's he's great. He really he really helps. Um, so let me answer that question. But Emily, you just allowed something to pop into my mind um, that I think is important as well. Now, obviously, the size of of what we do at three million a year allows us some leverage. There's there's no doubt about that. It was it was harder to do it at a million and a half. And I, I suspect it'll even be easier to do five, six million. But, you know, we're, we're building a pretty tight network in, in our area, right? So I will have drivers, uh, uh, sorry, uh, contractors, other contractors call me to help cover the runs, right? So as a PM guy going on vacation next week and, and he's in a smaller contract and he's locked into drivers, how do you handle that? Or the guy's away. Well, guess what? Here's Absolute, got some flexibility. We can help. We've done that tons of times and happy to do it because this is one of the key elements of working in a terminal where, you know, we're not working against each other. We're not in competition with one another. We literally want to build this robust network. That's, that's my passion anyways, is to, to be able to help other guys. Spots allow that to happen, right? So back to Emily's question. Uh, years ago, which maybe we can talk about this uh, later on in the podcast, but years ago, um, the spots um, around 215, 216 spots were on on an addendum. So they were included in the contract, FedEx contract. Um, since then, they've moved off and you basically get a an email every night that tells you where your spots are being delivered, Right. So now you'll have this, which is essentially like the addendum, but it's the email saying you're going to this location, five trailer drops on Monday, two trailer drops on Monday, and Monday, Tuesday, all the way through the week. So now you're getting this, this drop. Every, every week you get this email. So now what Sal does is navigate who's doing one, each one of those drops to those particular areas, right? And because we're doing them out of terminals, a lot of that is matched up where guys live right and where their tractors are parked so it makes it easy for them as well so they basically are delivering most of the same areas every week and then adding some nuances onto there to make it fluid and then and then receiving calls so maybe preempt emily would kind of like a secondary question to that is yes we do get call-ins from customers that will say hey i need two extra trailers you know um they call you directly. which is sometimes very they will call, so this is this is the, yeah this is the thing right so a lot of people don't know this right because there's this constant toss up between FedEx pushing back on spot contractors you don't own the contracts you know basically you're you're bought into thin air and you're delivering for our customer which is all true but here's the reality guys if you're a P&D, I, I benchmark it against P&D driver. If you're a P&D contractor or driver and you deliver in a certain zip code, you know, you have no guarantee that you're going to deliver to 123 Money Street more than, say, one time a year or one time a month. <clears throat> and if you know the people's names, you know it because you looked on the envelope, right? You know, this is like Mr. and Mrs. Kohler that live at, you know, 123 Money Street. Now, check this out. So literally, my manager and 
most of the drivers will have and develop robust relationships with these delivery spots, right? And they will call Sal and say, hey, we need two extra trailers. You know, business is picked up. And then Sal will call because FedEx wants us to call back to them to say, hey, can we do extra trailers? And the reason why they will say no is because of volume that evening. So we literally, at least in California, we do have this problem where FedEx is pushing back at times and, and legitimately so. I, I, get, I get why they do that. Is saying, yeah, you can't have, you know, one contract. Imagine if you multiply that and all you guys bring in, you know, an extra 50 trailers, like, like we, we don't have the handlers to do that. So, but it's, it's, it's encouraging, at least I, I think from my perspective is that we're building relationships. These guys call sell. So there's a robust relationship happening. And even though FedEx is like, well, you're, they're not your clients, which is true. We're servicing for FedEx. It's like we literally know their names and phone numbers, and our job is to keep them extremely happy and deliver as many trailers as they want, right? I mean, that's, that's the increase in business. So I think it's sometimes not all the um, terminal managers or even guys in Pittsburgh understand that the local contractor who's running spots effectively is servicing FedEx, you know, a marketing department that picked up the contract, now we're servicing it. But we're like the secondary marketing arm. Like, you know, we deliver on time, we do things right, we're kind, we're, we're considerate, and we're pushing. You want an extra trailer? Yes, sir, we'll get that there. You want five others? You want to believe it. We'll get you five extra trailers today. Like, it's just going to happen. And I don't know that that's always observed the way the contractors would pitch it in terms of, you know, the terminal managers and FedEx as a whole understanding how much we're really going to bat to service these customers. It's a lot of trailers. That's really interesting, Nora, but I feel like there, there might be room for you to negotiate some commission there with <laughs> FedEx for getting more trailers. <laughs> you would think, right? Yeah. It's like, so yeah, you would say yes. If your spot runs are not on your contract and they're not considered, considered dedicated, you get an email every night saying, hey, this is what you have. What is, what's the guarantee that you're actually going to get those runs? Is it possible that FedEx might give it to the guy next to you? And when you buy a business that has those spot runs, and you're using that revenue to purchase that business and to come up with that value on that business, what are you, what are you actually doing to guarantee that that revenue is going to keep coming in? Yeah, that's it. those are great questions, Jake. I knew you were going to turn up the heat and make it harder. <laughs> All right, here we go. Now, just to clarify, I have to be honest because I'm just, I'm just a regular Joe guy, right? Like I already declared I'm not the expert. And our team functions in, in a certain way that now I'm double guessing. I don't think they come every night. I think they come every week. This is what the email that you're doing for okay. the week. I, I think that's it. I should have had Sal on this podcast. I knew it. Well, we can have um, another one. So yeah, with the, yeah, that would be an interesting podcast, AO to BC and how, how it properly functions. Um, I, I cannot underestimate. Um, I, I don't want to say it publicly um, because I don't want it to get out, but anybody that wants to call me as a contractor, I'm going to tell you right now, um, I pay my manager a great amount of money and um, I want to do everything humanly possible um, to make that guy's life um, a bonus that he works for us and make it impossible. In fact, we do that with all our drivers. I want, we overpay. I want to make it impossible for them to leave. And we want to develop a culture. Um, in the spot drivers, you can do that more with the line hall. So every second week, on a Thursday, we take these spot drivers for lunch, and one of the line hall guys gets to come because he's done his route right at that time. And we wine and dine these guys every second week, and it's just like a family. You know, we have a a text thread uh, where guys are sending memes to each other. You know, one of the guys with a helmet and glasses on and driving the truck. It's just <laughs> insane. Like it's this family thing, and and because they're spots, you can do that. So I'm I'm landing this plane. So so. The idea that you can um, build these sort of relationships, right, and that you have a manager that that really is paying attention to this and wants to pick up 
extra stuff along the way. Like we always pick up extra stuff, right? So we're adding to these runs, right? So if, if there's times where we do trailer swaps, uh, I think um, on Monday we, we did 20 extra trailers from one terminal to another, right? So they call us. They're like, hey, you guys want to do 20 trailers? Yeah, we'll do 100 trailers if we need to, right? So, so there's, there's extreme flexibility. So now back to, um, back to the question at hand is the value of the spots, you're right. So they're not on the contract. You get this weekly email. Let's call it weekly. Hope I'm not corrected to daily. But <laughs> let's say you get this weekly email of where, where these spots are going. Um, and, and you're on this constant delivery, right? So the value in my mind is, and, and again, this is probably, and this is just me personally, but I think it's going to resonate, um, you know, massively in, in spot contractors that are listening. There is a real frustration that it's not on an addendum. That's for sure. Uh, I mean, I've heard this multiple times. Um, and there's some hesitation in, in the purchase and the sale, right? Like, um, I know tons of guys that have bought, I know got contractors that run just spots and, and these guys are ballers. Like a couple guys that I know very well. I mean, they, they run 10, 12 spot trucks and that's all that they run. Uh, and guess what? Spot trucks typically, right? They don't go through scales. They're in short distance. So they don't run near the mileages over the road. So you have, you have such a concise delivery area that isn't, that doesn't get, get, uh, I don't know, doesn't get scrutinized in the same way. And it's not that you run your, tr your tractors way less efficiently, or you, you're not paying it, uh, you know, to repair and maintenance. Of course you are, but you're not relegated to these scales. Like I've got pinched so often, you know, last couple of years on the scales on our longer runs, you know, cause some of these like San Diego runs, I do twice a night. So they're going through scales four times. One guy's going through scales four times a night. Like it's just insane. So, um, so in my mind, the value is, is the revenue. And I keep telling people, it's like, what's the revenue of this particular contractor space, whether he has spots. And in my mind, they, they have, they have equal revenue than any dedicated line haul run. And I mean that seriously. I've given a lot of guys the example. My kids run a coffee house in, in the city of Orange. Um, broke coffee. <laughs> a little nice. Broke little coffee. plug. Um, yeah, little plug. I'm telling you, it's the best coffee it, you know in the world. <laughs> they do a great job. And, and uh, um, you know, when I, I help them get started. And, you know, when you start something like that, guess what? You're fighting for every customer. And so when a coffee house or a restaurant, let's just use a round number. Coffee house brings in a um, million dollars revenue a year. You go, what's the company worth if you bring in a million dollars revenue a year, right? Well, guess what? That's a makeup of, you know, like there's a real estate agent that comes in every eight o'clock in the morning. He's there, gets the same drink for 30, 365 days a year. He won the award, like same thing every day. You can count on that, right? The families come in, you can count on they come. Our family goes on Saturdays. Usually there's anywhere from uh, 10 to 30 of our family that go every Saturday morning. But guess what? There's these intermittent people that go as well, right? And their dollar amount counts as much as the guy that comes regularly. So if a coffee house makes a million dollars revenue a year and they're looking for next year to go, hey, we're going to make a million one, that's consistent income, whether it's a regular customer or it's some guy that comes once a month or pops in brand new and says, wow, I found my new coffee house. Same thing with the FedEx model. Now I'm going to give a little plug for the, for the unassigned guys. Cause sometimes they take, they take it in the shorts, right? Some guy wants to buy unassigned, right? Says, I'm not buying those. They're not worth. Well, if a guy's bringing in a million dollars on unassigned runs last year, and he brings in a million 50 this year and nine seventy five the next year, there's consistent income just because they go different places doesn't mean that value. And again, this is my, this is my perspective. Doesn't mean that value is less than for sure. And so equally so with the spot runs. Now, one thing that, that factors in there and the, the guys that run spot runs will know this, that you're on a rotation in a terminal. 
So out of one of the terminals I run, there's three guys on rotation, which is which is very sweet, right? So every time FedEx gets a new client, it goes to the next person in that rotation. If that person in that rotation is is maximized, let's say, let's say, and there there are guys that are smaller contractors, they run, you know, three trucks, and they might be like, hey, I I can't handle this. This is the, say it's a bigger contract. And they're like, I'd have to bring in a new truck. I'd have to get another driver. I just can't handle it. They can pass. And then it goes to the next person on rotation. But guys have literally built their business from, you know, one, two trucks to nine, 10 trucks because they keep bringing on over years because the, uh, there, the, there is not an attrition downward. There, there is, there is acceleration upward. So I might lose one. I, and I'm going by memory. I think last year we we lost one contract, and I think we picked up two or three, something like that. So every one of these terminals has these rotations to which you're guaranteed, as much as anything can be guaranteed in any economy, that if if a, if a Fortune 50 company is determined to, with their marketing program, grow, I'm on the receiving end of that growth in a tight market, right? So I was shocked when I was... I was like, I never knew FedEx sent trailers to a furniture company that sends out three to four trailers a day in furniture. It's like, who the heck is buying all this furniture? And I didn't know FedEx was was delivering for that. So all of a sudden you realize that there's this massive company that wants to make their blip on the map. And I'm on the receiving end of that. I'm like, you guys go and sp- I, I'm not spending the marketing money. Right. I, it doesn't cost me a dime for in 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 my area for FedEx to go and get more business. They just come. Now, here is the, here is the value of the spot, in my opinion, is FedEx has to deliver these. They have to deliver. Right. So now you're looking at it going, you know, Joel, who owns the company, is more passionate about being on time and making money and executing in a way that makes FedEx. FedEx happy than anybody else, right? So, so now you've got kind of like this, this merger of all the sweet things, a fortune 50 company that's trying to make money. And you got contractors that are trying to grow their business and maximizing with efficiency and making FedEx more money and everybody wins. It does. Does That makes sense. Thank you. That was a great explanation. I loved the analogy with the coffee house. That was perfect. You kind of alluded to this earlier, but I'd like to go back to the cost of running a spot versus the cost of running maybe an over the road or even an AM PM just with more miles. Can you talk a little bit more specifically about how much you spend on trucks and maintenance and fuel for spot runs versus what you spend on your other assigned or unassigned runs? Yeah. Ooh, Emily, (laughs) <laughs> Bonuses for Emily, Jake. She she's picking up a good one here. This is gonna surprise. This is gonna surprise some people. I know contractors that that I would consider them friends. I've learned so much off of these guys. I, I intentionally try to find these guys that, and and I do because of the consulting part of what I do. Um, there are spot guys out there that only do spots and do like north of five million uh, a year. Like it's insane. Those. Fuel costs for spot trucks run anywhere from 17 to 19% of revenue. Now, I know that over the road guys, they're probably going to get mad at me for this and wonder if I'm speaking the truth again. I, I literally am. I can prove it on my own P&Ls. All right. So the minute you go to uh, the, the line haul, dedicated line haul solo runs, it'll push it up to the low 20s, right? And then over the road guys will go anywhere from 23. I've seen as high as 26% of revenue on fuel. Wow. Right. When it was a little bit higher. So taking, taking into consideration fuel prices, right. All that varies, but you definitely have a disparity between the spot runs are on the lower end of fuel, which, which is, which is counterintuitive, right? You think you're the trucks that are running around the city because all these guys make what five, six miles per gallon, um, maybe a little bit more on the newer trucks. And ironically, it's it's more efficient per revenue cost. Doesn't mean they're making more miles per gallon. Per revenue cost. See, that's the difference, right? So if I can take 
say say I peg my average spot truck as as fifty five hundred, and he does a uh, hundred and ninety miles a day to accomplish that five days a week or six days a week to get that income number, then the mileage, the fuel mileage per revenue cost actually pushes down the percent of revenue, right? So it's not necessarily that he's making better miles per gallon. He's not. It's just the, the delta between the revenue that this guy can bring in in X amount of miles it increases that delta. So you can run 17, 19% on fuel per spot. Um, same thing with maintenance. Um, you know, there are like just, just for an, an example. Now, you know, I'm going to preface what I say. Don't, don't misunderstand this, that, you know, we're getting sloppy with say, say, um, maintenance in terms of tires, right? Like I'm, I'm not saying that at all, but if you, ha I have over the road trucks, not over the road, but line haul trucks that do day solo runs. I use lease trucks for that. And there's one of these things that you go, here's these lease trucks. They get checked by these people. I hire another mechanic who every weekend checks my trucks. It costs me money. Independent mechanic that checks my trucks every weekend so that when these trucks, newer trucks, go through the scales, I do not want to get popped. So it's costing me money and time and consideration to make sure that if there's a question on a tire, I'm back at the leasing company going, we got to change these tires, right? Not because that particular tire is like, well, it might have another three, three, you know, 3,000 miles left, but am I going to risk that going through the scales? I can't. So on the spot runs, I do have a little bit more slush there, if you will, mm -hmm. right? Because they're local. Right. And, and every FedEx contractor knows you've got your tire guy, your windshield guy, your AC guy and three mechanics that service all that. And on the spot runs, they're literally, you know, 15 minutes away from where my tractor is. So it's very efficient. That sounds really efficient on the spot runs because you are local. You're going from a furniture store to the terminal. You're going through more stoplights roundabouts, more turns, how do you, and probably more trafficked areas as opposed to just going straight down a freeway, how do you manage um, the safety with the drivers? And do you see more safety violations with your spot runs as opposed to your dedicated or side runs? Great question, Jake. Now you're back up to par with yes. Emily. Good That's question. What I so for. I don't know yes. if I'll ever be back up to par um, with Emily, but well, man, Jake, you're running, you're, you're, yeah, you're running a close <laughs> second. Let's just say that. So, so, um, yeah, um, you did say, don't take yourself too seriously in this podcast. <laughs> so here we go. A little bit of laughter is good for the soul. Um, so Jake, this is, this is the thing, right? So safety and, and points, you know, now that we've changed going from, you know, a five to a one to a metal system with gold, silver, and bronze. We're, we're shaking all that up. But let's, for some of the OG guys on here, you're typically, you know, you're, you're five, you're, you're, you're got the best safety score. You're one, you're at the bottom of the heap. Now you're looking for some issues with FedEx. So everybody's trying to keep that safety score up. Here's what I can tell you. My, my day cab line haul runs have been more of an issue for me than my spots have. And the reason is, and this one just agitates the daylights out of me, is one time I got popped because there was a nail in the tire, right? So you go through the scales, there's a nail in the tire. It's not even flat. There's just a nail in the tire, you know? And it's like, I could have picked that one up on the exit to the scales. Like, you, I don't know, right? Well, that infraction is like a small accident. Like the points that it cost me is, is like a small accident, right? So it's, it's highly irritating. So on the spots, I mean, we pitch safety every day. We try to communicate with our drivers and we do this through cell is guys, make sure, right? Like make sure you pay attention because, and, and again, this is probably one of the areas that I would consider uh, and, and 
guys that run robust bot systems, they're going to identify with this, is that it's probably one of the systems that's very unfair in the FedEx world, right? Because you're generally garnering back safety points or eliminating, even though it's a mystery, because sometimes, you know, terminal managers aren't exactly <laughs> sure how you're gaining back the points, but we know that it's mileage related to some degree, right? To a great degree. So imagine if you're over the road and you got this semi that's going 60, 65 miles an hour and racking up miles, right? And bringing in X amount of dollars. Well, spot trucks to bring in that, that bring in the same amount of revenue are doing way less miles, but they're in much more peril, right? So, so think about that. Rather than being on a freeway, like you suggested, I've got guys going through stop signs, stop lights, right hand turns, left hand turns, Southern California traffic up the wazoo, and you're in and out of freeways, off freeways, like constantly trailer drops, trailer hooks, back and forth, the whole enchilada. It's just, it's insane when you think of that you're making the same mileage points for X amount of revenue with all these added safety um, issues that could be there in terms of risk, right? So that is one of the things in the spot world that you got to pay attention with. And it's one of the things that we constantly try to remind our guys is, you know, take your time. You're not going to, you're not going to win that extra thing by going faster in the city or taking your time to do this, right? It's just get the job done and be safe. But yeah, way more, way more potential for incidences. But this is where I give, I give kudos to our FedEx drivers as a whole. Um, these guys are pros, man. I mean, when I, 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 I have a, a CDL license. Um, I've driven the truck a couple times years ago. I used to have a bus license. And so I, I drive for fun. Like I don't do this, but every time I get in the truck, even to take it to a shop or something, cause I, I can, and I want to help. I'm like, I get into that thing. I'm like, dang, these guys do this every day in and out 14, 16 drops. Um, and, and not to dismiss the line hall guys too. It, it, this is hard work and they're pros and they do an excellent job, but yeah. There's more risk on spots. There's no doubt about it. I'm going to change gears just a little bit, Norb, if you don't mind. Um, wanted to give you an opportunity to share a little bit about some of your other business. So you are also a route broker, correct? Yeah. Yeah. I um, do the West Coast for a company called Ground Consult out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, Dave runs the proprietor there. And Dave was... Um, Again, I use the term so like an OG baller, right? He back in the day he ran big P and D in Minneapolis, and he was very successful. And he was a financial guru at the same time. And when he sold, he organically had guys say, "Hey, you know, can you help me sell the business?" Yeah, okay. Well, that turned into a a boutique um, brokerages because we're very very small, right? Like we're not huge, um, but we pride ourselves in being boutique if that's a word, and um, and agile, and we're practitioners. So I do the West Coast from Montana over, so Line Hall and P&D. And one of the things that, that I think I'm most proud of, and as you might have already guessed in our previous conversations, is that I'm super passionate about being a practitioner and being able to help guys that want to get in the business and help guys that, that are looking to exit the business, right? So, so I, I probably um, don't sell as much as other guys do because one of the things that I'm really a stickler about is what I think these things are worth, right? So I'm always arguing, and I have a phenomenal SBA broker. Um, this guy, again, he's a baller. I, I'm glad I find these people because, you know, you dance around with SBA people and it's really difficult. So this guy, um, you know, we do we do carve outs and everything. It's no problem. We can virtually SBA almost everything and anything that's in the FedEx world. So I'm always fighting for the contractor to get the fair and highest price because I'm also part of the business, right? So I understand it. So I tell buyers when you come in, I'm like, you got to understand if this guy's built this business for X amount of years and he's got great revenue coming in, 
because I also sell real estate. So I'm always juxtaposing those things. So if I got a guy that's running line homes, say he does 5 million a year and he's built a great business and, and he's you know clear of any SBA debt and he's making a great uh, uh, um, percent of, of net income on his revenue. And I go, I go to the buyer, do you realize that most often what you, what you Kai Bosch's deals, and I've literally had this happen where the guy before the sale goes to his accountant and his accountant says, well, what are you going to do to replace that, you know, half a million dollar income? Well, I'm going to take the money and put it in real estate. Well, you're not going to get, you're not going to get an exchange on that real estate investment for what you're making on line hall. It's like, oh, really? Oh, maybe I should keep it a few more years. So I, I only say that to say that when, when I'm looking at the brokerage part of it, and helping guys to sell, I'm extremely passionate about getting the top dollar for guys that have worked hard to build a robust business. And the value is in the percent of revenue. Now, I, I got to say this because I, I, I think one of the most difficult things that I face as a, as a guy that sells these and consults with guys is I've had guys that literally want to sell their business and they give me p ls that are basically on the back of a napkin right and it's an only a slight exaggeration but not to, not to confuse things these guys know exactly what they're doing and they're making great money and they know exactly what they're doing they're great contractors they just haven't navigated into that world or you have the next stage guy that's that's really locked into hey i need your p l you're going to do an sba loan for this buyer, I need three years tax returns, I need P&Ls, I need balance sheets, and I need Q1, and I need it by next week. Well, hang on, let me go call my bookkeeper who's you know six <laughs> feet deep and I'll get back to you in nine months. I'm like, no, that's not gonna work. Which by the way, I had a great call awesome. with um, Matt who you had on nice. several podcasts ago. And we had that conversation, I go, Matt, I wanna pitch you to guys. I need You need accountants and bookkeepers that know the FedEx world that can Flip this on a dime. And I've literally showed buyers and sellers my own P&Ls, our company's P&Ls. And I said, if you do this, like literally I can punch out within 10 minutes, I can tell you year to date what we're making just on how you structure the P&Ls. So I think my contribution is also to how can I help guys to position themselves for a sale? Because a lot of times they don't think about that. Even as something as simple as a tax return, right? You can send me P&Ls that show something. By the time your tax accountant's done with it, you're not making any money. Well, that's what everybody wants to show, right? Like we don't want to make any money. Problem is when that tax returns go to the SBA guys, they're like, well, this business makes no money. And I'm like, uh, hang on. Yes, it does. <laughs> okay. So you got to work. So, so now what a lot of times I do is I go, hey, before you submit that tax return, I want to see the draft and I want uh, um, my finance guys back at, at the uh, brokerage, right? I want them to vet this and go through this and then we'll give some, some feedback to the accountant to go, hey, if you, if you navigate this just slightly different, you can, you can accomplish what you want and you can prep yourself for sale. So those are things that guys just don't think about. So anyways, I'm probably dragging this out too long. Yeah, super passionate about that. Love to help guys um, get what they deserve, you know. Um, I've argued until I'm blue in the face on, yeah, these, these unassigned runs are, are, they have value because they're constantly bringing in money and they're the stepping stone to growing. You cannot grow. You guys know this. You cannot grow a FedEx um, company without unassigned runs unless you're buying additional, unless you're spending the money to buy it, right? So I sell a guy's, I'm, I've got a guy's sale right now and he's got nine dedicated runs. Um, I'm pitching for that guy to get top dollar. because all. So if you're going to buy it with nine dedicated runs, you're, you're going to pay through the nose, right? So these are the balances between fighting for what the value of the business is and teaching new guys that are coming into the business usually takes me a good 30, 40 minutes on a phone call to, you know, let's go to 30,000 feet. I'll give you the whole spiel. 
And it's like, now you go back. Cause I know one thing is you've watched one too many YouTube videos <laughs> and then you're, <laughs> now you're going to Now you're going to tell that seller who's owned that for 20 years, what he's going to sell the business for. No, you need to turn off YouTube. I'll give you <laughs> half an hour schooling for free. And then we're going to go to that guy and thank him for the hard work that he's put into his business. Right. And we're going to do a, a consulting agreement where the baton pass from seller to buyer is smooth, except for one deal in my lifetime, one deal, every other deal, the seller is extremely passionate to, to, to do an effective handoff so that the next guy can succeed and do well in the FedEx world. There you go. Beautiful. Norb, um, before we go into the final three questions that we ask every contractor that is on the show, I had one more question circling back to the spot runs that we were talking about earlier. Because they're not going as many miles as dedicated or unassigned runs, I'm assuming you're paying your drivers in a different way than you're paying your uh, dedicated and unassigned run drivers. Are you, how do you approach that? What's different in pay? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so, and again, my comments are going to be, I'm, I'm going to kind of aggregate my comments to a, a U.S. model, right? So every state has different laws. In California, we're, we're at the strictest of pay per hour, pay per um, overtime and double time, right? But generally speaking, I think it's a very common understanding that in the FedEx world, if you start with, say, line haul, you're, you're paying X, X amount per mile, right? And the way that happens typically is relegated towards the laws of the states to say, if you're paying somebody X amount of miles, then you're, you're, you're reverse engineering into that off of your uh, ELD, how many hours the guy went, this is how much they're getting paid per hour, this is how much they're getting in, you know, time and a half and double time so that it's legit, right? You understand that. So, so you're reverse engineering from, say, you know, on a, on a solo cab guy, 80 cents a mile, and you're paying this guy and he's doing these runs and you're reverse engineering that, you know, here, here's what you're making per hour, time and a half, double time. Um, one of the things that every contractor faces and, and and not only line haul but in the p d world you know if you go to p d contractors it's very evident that you have a package handler and delivery guy that can do you know 150 packets packages a day and another guy can do 225 and there's variances to that some are handling larger packages depending on the delivery but every contractor knows that you have guys that can do more and guys that can do less, and I'm not discriminating guys and gals, they, they each have the capacity depending on their desire to what? Either be a good employee or make more money, right? So it's incumbent on every contractor, whether P&D and line haul, go, how am I going to reward my guys that work hard and gals that work hard so that they can be rewarded. And how do I hedge against, I got a driver who, you know, my, my BC might be monitoring and know where they're going, but I don't know, I don't really know whether it's a, you know, half an hour lunch or 45 minute lunch or an hour and a half lunch or stop over here. It, it's harder to really predict those things unless you go and dig in. And I think every contractor finds out at some point in time or, or another is, and I, and I want to use the, the, the words uh, very cautiously, okay, that they're being taken advantage of. So I'm not, I'm not saying that every driver is out there, you know, trying to take advantage of his boss, but it, it does happen where you're like, how can I maximize the return on my investment as a business owner and incentivize these guys? So um, I've spoken to a lot of guys around the country that have figured out very robust ways, whether it's, uh, X amount of cents per mile, right? So now whatever you drive is what is the return. Now, when you're in a, say, over the road or a dedicated run, that's pretty static, right? Like what you're doing 
today was the same as what you did last night and so on and so forth, right? But on spot drivers, it's, it's, it's way more fluid. So for example, if you're doing the same, but not in mileage, but in percent of revenue, and I, and I learned this, that some of the, again, these were like old timer, you consider them old timer contractors, right? Like years ago, you hear this, well, they paid guys 40% of revenue, right? And the drivers really knew, never knew what that meant, right? Because they're not showing them the settlement statement going, you made 40% of revenue. They just guessed that they made that, right? But the idea was that, that if you work hard and do extra stuff, which you can do in the spot world, is that you get paid more. Right. So there is an opportunity in the spot world where you can do a percent of revenue. And again, depending on the, the state and the law that you're in, you have to reverse engineer that. So it's legit. Right. To go. This is how much hours you're making. But it's not it's not financial rocket science. Like you just got to get into there, into the nitty gritty. And you can find out that if a guy makes X amount per hour and this much overtime, this much double time, it's this much pay. Now you go to the spot runs and you, you average that. Let's say you keep, you go back even 52 weeks and you go, aha, there's a, there's a thread here that this guy's making about 35% of revenue. And if I reverse engineer that, I'm going to be spot on to this guy's pay within a dollar. But what if I tell him I'm in Arkansas somewhere, or let's say Arizona and I have this ability to say to the guy, you run spots for me in Phoenix and I'm going to pay you a 35, 36% of revenue, whatever you decide. But now you're giving that guy opportunity to go, if you do 13 trailers or you do 16 trailers, you're getting paid more, right? Or if the contra or, or if the, and this happens all the time, we will pick up as I said to you, we'll pick up extra. So over the weekend, we did a bunch of trailer deliveries for FedEx, 20, 30 trailers. Can't remember what it was. And so guess what? You're asking guys to come in on a Saturday that maybe normally don't. Hey, who, who wants to make some extra money? <clears throat> so same, same type of thing, right? Now, what the challenge with that is, is to do it in a way where you're, where you're not compromising on the safety, right? So in other words, you, you allow guys to do extra, you, you pay them for that, <clears throat> and you make it um, beneficial for them, but you also want to capture that in a way where they're not compromising safety, right? And so, again, um, kudos to Sal. He, he literally calls every one of my drivers multiple times a day. Like, this guy's a, um, he lives on the phone. Um, so, he's constantly calling guys to go, hey, how's it going? Safety, remember, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and so you have this measuring rod of that you can pay guys well and that they can make a good wage and your company can make more money. I don't know if I answered that the way you wanted to hear it, but I think you get the Absolutely incentive-based. I love it. Totally, totally. And, and again, I can tell you this, Jake and Emily, I, I've met contractors who... Not that they don't understand that. <clears throat> they have the view that, hey, I have a guy, he makes $1,400 a week, and there's no way I'm paying him more than $1,400 a week because I don't have to pay him more than $1,400 a week, right? Because why would I? He's a truck driver, makes $1,400 a week. I regularly have guys make between twenty two dollars and $2,500 a week. Wow. That's dope. So, so. Hey, it's like, you know, um, again, I'm trying to make it impossible for them to leave. And it's, uh, it's, it's a cost that, that I have to bear, right, on the greater whole. But in terms of measuring that outcome, in terms of the health and the culture of the company and, and the guy's willingness to work hard, and every time I tell Sal, my manager, Friday, tell him, you tell me when the horses are in the stable. You know, we, you, you kind of like, tell me when the race cars are back on the track, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> and every time we message to that group, hey, guys, thanks for your hard work and your diligence. You guys are the best, you know, like, and, and you know, um, Joel leads that charge. He's, he, he's an amazing leader and, and it shows. 
and um, we all follow in the company and you just realize that that bears um, witness to you're running something that's healthy, not only healthy in terms of company growth, not only healthy in terms of company viability and income, but also um, for the guys that are in the trucks, you know, I, I want them to make the best living that they possibly can. And I'll tell you, in, in these last um, two and a half years that we've owned the company, um, three guys are in the process or have bought homes. Um, another three or four guys have bought their dream cars. And, uh, you know, having done real estate as well, like nothing turns my crank more than to see that, wow, the, you know, I want these guys to be able to, as best they can, live the life that they want to live. And I want to treat them with respect. Um, and yeah, so all that adds up to um, spots allow for some of that in, in a way that other scenarios don't in, in the same way, right? You can do it in all areas. We do it with the line haul drivers too. We just have to tweak it a little different. Um, Sometimes the line haul guys, they have to wait for the second load. If they go down to San Diego once to come back up, the terminal makes them wait two, three hours for the next load. So guess what? I either incentivize the guys to say, I'll make it worth you waiting two, three hours because it'll benefit me as well because it pushes up my top line revenue. But I'll make it back. I don't expect you to sit there for three hours and not get paid or whatever, like, like you're going to get paid and I will incentivize you to participate in getting the best out of the company as we can. And you're going to win too. So you have to find it in each one of those niches. All right. Well, we are running up at an hour and I want to respect your time. So we're going to jump into our three to thrive with FedEx. So the first question is what is one of the most worthwhile investments that you have made into your FedEx business? I, number one, the drivers. I for sure the drivers is the number one thing. Um, I would say number two is is robust systems, which we're still learning. Um, um, I listened to your podcast probably has to be six six eight months months ago now with Tim mm -hmm. at my ground force. We adopted that model, um, and we found out pretty quickly uh, we were we were burn money by guys fueling other places other than FedEx terminal, right? And our guys have a choice. I just didn't know exactly how much it was costing me until Tim showed me. I'm like, holy cow, wow. I'm burning like 900 bucks a week just by these guys filling up. Some so we, we said, guys, you got to go at the terminal. So guess what I did? I said, every time you fill up at the terminal and it costs you extra to drive there, I'll pay you. I don't mind. So investment in the guys, investment in systems. And I think the, the third one, I would say, um, cause in systems I'm including, you know, mechanics and everything to make sure it's, it's, it's well, well run. And I would say the third one, which again, all the guys that have run for a long time is investing time with terminal management and making sure you're a part of the system, the FedEx system. If you run it well, you can, you know, there's always this tension between, is it absentee owner? Well, nothing's totally absentee owner, but if you run it well, like I know very successful guys that, you know, they golf three or four times a week, they <laughs> race their speed boats and do all kinds of different things, you know, like literally, cause they've built a very good system, but, but pulling back into the FedEx world, participating, we show up at every line hall meeting that we can go to. P and D guys should do the same. Don't lose the connection because there's a lot of familiarity. And um, I think that helps the whole system in terms of health. Cool. Thanks, Norb. Our second question for the final three to thrive. Oftentimes failure in business is the greatest teacher. Do you have a favorite failure in FedEx and what did you learn from it? Oh, Jeez. Um, I, I do. I probably have multiples. I think, I, I think I'd have to come back to 
just, you know, how, how serious just even going through scales for us is. And, and maybe we just go through it more than the average person. I don't, I don't think so, but you know, we do a lot of scales on our, you know, solo AM and PM runs. And, and I don't know that I fully understood how that animal can get, get you, you know, and how much you have to pay attention to that. So we've had to make some changes, as I mentioned, with truck allocation to make sure that we don't miss the mark on that and that we, um, that we over predict, um, success in that, I guess is the point. So, um, you know, I think that's one thing that, um, we've had to really shore up and are still in the process of refining and it's cost us money to do it. So, um, that's one thing I'm, I'm proud that we've, we've nailed down and, and hopefully have more success in that area. I love it. Last question. What is your favorite part about contracting with FedEx? I would say the, the, and and I'm probably repeating myself here. I would say the combination of, uh, driver relation income company success, that, that triad there, right? It's like, it's like the, the drivers, they're not just the utility for us. They, they, they are real people that we want to make successful in their own lives and how much they contribute to the health and welfare of the business. And I, I, I don't think that, uh, you know, I run four other businesses and I'm, I'm a solo guy. So this is really the first time I've ever been a part of a business with multiple employees that, um, you're now looking out for their welfare and you can see how, if that's a key item, how that plays into the success of the whole organization and in relationship to FedEx as well. Nice. I love it. Norb, if people want to reach out to you for um, your route sales on the Western side of the United States um, or, uh, or your kid's coffee shop or going to Disneyland, how do they reach out to you? <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with the easy. Coffee shop Brot, B R O T, Brot. It's in the city of Orange, across from Chalk Hospital. Chalk's a legendary children's hospital of Orange County. Um, so, yeah, you can visit there anytime. <laughs> and hey, if you hit me up, I'll go and buy you a coffee there. No problem. <laughs> um, I can be reached uh, at Norb Kohler at groundconsult.com, just as it sounds. Norb Kohler at groundconsult.com. Um, and uh, yeah, be happy to help. In, in any way possible there as well. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time today, Norb. We really appreciate you coming on, educating us and, and everyone else about your spot runs. And uh, we might have to bring you back with Sal here one day soon. Yeah, so, sounds great. I Just l- let me conclude with this one thought. I did find out why I was confused between the daily and the oh. weekly on the emails out. And that's because one of the terminals sends it out weekly and the other one sends it out daily. So there you go. <laughs> Massive confusion nice. solved. Awesome. Right? We're going to pull that one out. Ha- happy, happy to be on with you guys. Again, not the resident pro, just a guy trying to make hay of the whole thing and um, doing our best. Um, again, shout out to Joel, our AO, and Sal, who works hard. Um, the whole thing couldn't happen with each guy doing their part. And thanks, guys. I've learned a lot from rooting uh, for success. I don't just say that. I, I've literally listen to almost every podcast, not every, and I make it a regular habit for contractors and newbies when they want to get into the space. And um, they'll say, Hey, how do I find out about the future of FedEx? You know, I go, Hey, just listen to, and I'll pick out a couple of the spot, the podcast. I can't remember the guy's name, but you had somebody on there that was in the FedEx world for like 35 years. That might've been one of the first ones. I was like, Oh dang, there's just so much information. (laughs) So um, shout out to you guys. Thanks for putting this together. It's, it's, it's critical. I, I hope more and more people pick it up and learn from others who are in the Amazing. business. Thank you again. Th- thanks, Norm. Thanks guys. 
Routing for Success is brought to you by AP Equipment Financing. In today's competitive market, it is essential to acquire the right trucks at a fair price and finance them in a way that makes sense for your business. Leveraging their extensive network of truck and van suppliers, the experts at AP Equipment Financing will help you locate the best deals on step vans, cutaways, panel vans, and more. Deliver them straight to your facility and finance them with low monthly installment options. Click the link in the description or visit APFinancing.com for more information. Routing for Success is an independent production of AP Equipment Financing and is in no way affiliated with or endorsed by FedEx Corporation, FedEx Ground, Amazon, or any other logistics company discussed herein. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Routing for Success. Thank you.